Good morning, and welcome to the historic church of St. Agnes, situated in the historic town of Grantstown, over the hill. Today is considered a Sunday, the feast, within the octave of the Feast of St. Agnes, which we celebrated on the 21st of January. We are witnessing the procession from the front door of the church up the center aisle to the altar for the beginning of the service. The celebrant for the service this morning is the rector of St. Agnes, the Venerable Archdeacon I. Ranfully Brown. Angus in Grantstown has always been looked forward to uh, by many around the area, especially the uh, outdoor witness called the Patronal Festival, which takes place at 3 3 30 in the afternoon. There is Archdeacon Ranfrey Brown. We begin the service proper with a processional hymn for all the saints who from their labors rest. Those of you who are Anglicans may find this is hymn number 437 in your hymnal.
second hymn for the procession around the church is number 436, Hark the Sound of Holy Voices. The significance of the procession around the church this morning, which is unusual for 7 a.m. Mass, is the Patronal Festival. Although there will be another wider uh, procession this afternoon when the, the congregation, the choir, the, the clergy will parade down Blue Hill Road, across Meadow Street, up Augusta Street, across Meeting Street, into Dillard Street, back down, back down the hill to the church for benediction. What you're watching are the members of the senior choir of St. Agnes. There is Mrs. Rosemary Thompson, the wife of the former rector of the church, the late Archdeacon William Thompson.
As we begin the main part of the Mass, we have the introit hymn, How Bright These Glorious Spirits Shine, it's number 438 in your hymnal. During this, the singing of the hymn, the celebrant, Ashley Jim Brown, will sense the altar. Third Sunday after Epiphany, also celebrated as a Sunday within the octave of the Feast of St. Agnes. And so the collects you will hear this morning are for both for the Feast of St. Agnes and for the third Sunday after the Epiphany. Today is the Sunday within the octave of the Feast of St. Agnes, Virgin and Martyr, our patron saint. You are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. 
Blessed Lord and Father, Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known. And choose the weak things of the world to confound those things that are strong. Mercifully grant that we who keep the feast of blessed Agnes, that thy virgin and martyr, may feel the succor of her intercession in thy sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, and now and forever. We now have the reading of the first lesson by Mrs. Gloria Gomez. It's taken from the book of Ecclesiasticus, chapter 51, verses 1 to 12.
A reading from the Word of God, written in Ecclesiasticus chapter 51, reading verses 1 through 12. I shall give thanks to you, Lord and King. I shall praise you, God my Savior. I give thanks to you because you have been my protector and my helper, rescuing me from destruction, from the trap laid by a slanderous tongue, and from lips that invent lies. In the face of my assailants, you came to my help. In the fullness of your mercy and honor, you rescued me, and gnashing teeth waiting to devour me. From hands that threatened my life, from the many troubles I endured, from the choking fire enveloping me, from flames I had not kindled, from the deep recesses of the grave, from the foul tongue and the lying word, a wicked slander spoken in the king's presence. I came very near to death, close to the brink of the grave. On every side I was surrounded, and there was no one to help. I looked for human aid, and there was none. Then I remembered your mercy, Lord, what you did in days long past. You deliver those who put their trust in you and free them from the power of their enemies. From the earth I sent up my prayer, begging to be rescued from death. I cried, Lord, you are my father. Do not abandon me in time of trouble when I am helpless in the face of arrogance. I shall praise you continually I shall sing hymns of thanksgiving. My petition was granted, for you saved me from destruction, bringing me out from the desperate plight. Therefore, I shall give you thanks and praise. I shall bless the name of the Lord. The word of the Lord.
A reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17. Reader is Mr. Noel Starup, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 17 to 11. Let him boast of the Lord, for it is not the one who commends himself, but the one whom the Lord recommends, who is to be accepted. I should like you to bear with me in a little foolishness, Please bear with me. I am jealous for you with the jealousy of God, for I betroth you to Christ, thinking to present you as a chaste virgin to our true and only husband. The word of the Lord. with the gradual hymn, Jesus, the Virgin Crown, do thou. As an introduction to the Holy Gospel, which today is taken from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 25, verses 1 to 13. Gospel will now be read by the assistant curate of St. Agnes, Father Neil Nairn. The 25th chapter, beginning at the first verse. When the day comes, the kingdom of heaven will be like this. There were ten girls who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five prudent. When the foolish ones took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the others took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was a long time in coming, 
they all doze off to sleep. But at midnight, there came a shout, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then the girls all got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, our lamps are going out. Give us some of your oil. No, they answered. There will never be enough for all of us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. While they were away, the bridegroom arrived. Those who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others came back. Sir, sir, open the door for us, they cried. But he answered, truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake then, for you know neither the day nor the hour. This is the gospel of Christ. Now, we have a solo by Mrs. Werner Elcock, Heaven Came Down and Glory Filled My Soul, to be followed by the sermon by guest preacher, Father Shabaza Turnquest, the prior parish priest in charge of the churches of St. Margaret and St. Mary Magdalene in Andros.
Please be seated. Before I begin, I would like to extend um, my sincere thank you to your rector, curate, associates, for their gracious invitation to have me come in to be your guest preacher here at this 7 a.m. Mass on this the Sunday of your Patronal Festival. And I remember as a little boy, in the afternoon at the Patronal Festival itself, I would be in the band with the great ones, Charles Carey and Roderick Sims and Ivan Hanna with that little small trumpet. And you know, St. Agnes Patronal was always on Super Bowl Sunday, so we used to call it the Super Bowl of Patronal Festivals. And when the band would line up, we would always be wondering, I wonder if they're going on a short march today or if they're going to take the long march today. And when they take the long march, as we're coming up by St. John's Native Baptist and everybody's tired and your face is hurting and you can't remember the notes to play because the march is so long, you look forward with anticipation because you know at the end of the march, the refreshment <laughs> will be worthy of the Super Bowl itself. And so on this day, as you celebrate your patronal festival, I bring you greetings 
from Candice, my wife, who's here, and our son Aaron, the officers and members of the historic church of St. Margaret with St. Mary Magdalene in Nicholstown and Mastic Point, North Andrus. And I wish every blessing and success upon your clergy, your officers, and you, the members of this powerful church, as you seek to serve God through your witness here in this part of his vineyard. I speak to you now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I have taken the liberty to use as one of my texts the reading for the third Sunday of Epiphany. One of my texts comes from Nehemiah chapter 8, beginning at the first verse. All the people gathered together into the square before the water gate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it, facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the heirs of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So they read from the book, from the law of God with interpretation. They gave the sense so that people could understand the reading. The theme for my sermon this morning is the importance of education and understanding with respect to developing a full appreciation and acceptance of our interpretation of Christianity as Anglicans. The same Christianity that you have shared here in this area of Grantstown all these many years. The importance of education and understanding. In the late 1800s, the historian Father Frederick Barrow Matthew was the parish priest of All Andrus. He lived in Mangrove Key, where Father Denrick Roll lives today. And he had under his care all of the churches from Mangrove Key all the way up to Nichols Town. There was no road, so he would have to get in a boat to go and visit these, these stations at Bering Point and Bowen Sound and Fresh Creek and Mastic Point and Stanyard Creek. He was a hard worker, having brought his family from England to live in the harsh environments of our tropical climate. And he set about serving his God to the best of his ability. His job involved traveling for long distance by boat to visit each of the church stations, often leaving his family for months at a time. During the time of his travels and writings, the sponge trade was king in the Bahamas. There were no men in the church. They were all out on the sponge flats, harvesting the sponge, selling it to the Greek merchants, taking their money and spending it in Nassau on liquor and loose women. Then, having exhausted all funds, head back to the sponge bags and start the process all over again. Bishop Roscoe Shedden, in his book, Up and Down, Ups and Downs in a West Indian Diocese, speaks of the average sponging trip. And I thank your curate, Father Bean, who loaned me his copy of the book so that I can read this. He says, if the sponges had a good trip, the hospital would be full with cases of venereal disease. And if the sponges had a bad trip, the jail would be full 
of angry sponges. And this is the climate that Frederick Matthew, the priest, found himself ministering in, in the Bahamas. In 1892, in the quarterly mission paper, he tells the story of stopping in Bearing Point, only to find two women in church and one old Baptist woman who had leprosy, a woman that he visited on his pastoral rounds. Her own people would not visit her, so it is the Anglican priest who stops in to visit the woman with leprosy, who lives out the Christian imperative, saying, I was sick and you did not visit me. I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was naked and you didn't clothe me. And traveling a little further north to Fresh Creek, he encounters a similar situation. Only women and small children in church. And out through the church window, he watches no less than seven sloops tacking to and fro, racing to get to Nassau with their cargo of sponge, briskly on a Sunday morning. No Sunday school, no confirmation class, no form of Christian education whatsoever. The catechist, William Henry Sweeting, was fighting a losing battle against dissent and apathy that had seeped into the fabric of the lives of the people. With prosperity comes vice, St. Agnes. These people worship me only with their lips, for their hearts are far away from me. Before the recession, everybody was talking, it's your season. Plant a seed. The Lord's going to bless you. After the recession, I can't hear anything. Where's my seed? God is not mocked, and he's not trifled with. The hand of God is stronger than any human hand. A little further north, he stops into the station of St. Faith, Stanyard Creek, to once again find things depressing. Two drunk women lounging in the door of the church. The church itself falling into ruin because of neglect. And the catechist, as Barrow Matthew put it, has seen the light. And he has gone off to join another church. The catechist of the church in Stanyard Creek has seen the light and has gone off to join another church. The catechist has gotten saved and has gone elsewhere. The church is no longer good enough for him. And he speaks of a similar situation in Cat Island because Frederick Barrow Matthew was a priest in Cat Island before he went to Andrus, and he encountered a similar situation in Cat Island. And all of this gets the missionary priest depressed. He gets depressed. All of this ruin and decay in the fabric of the buildings, and more importantly, in the moral character of the people. All of this gets the priest depressed. And those of you who know Andres, leaving Stanyard Creek now, he takes his little boat out past the reef and heads up. And a little further north, he stops into the settlement of Mastic Point. And here, he finds things completely different. Listen to what he writes. Leaving Stanyard Creek, saddened and depressed, I made for the next station, Mastic Point. Mastic Point proved a little oasis in the spiritual desert. The catechist evidently loves his little church and spoke cheerfully of his congregation. Here one sees the good work Father Fisher has done for the church in this colony. The catechist here was an old choir boy of Father Fisher's and his early training in St. Agnes, Nassau, has stood him well. He has his congregation well in hand on a nice little Sunday and day school. How important good sound teaching is was illustrated here. 
I found in his house some powerful books against infant baptism given him by Baptist preachers who have been here. Also, any amount of Plymouth Brethren literature. But he loves his little church and his anecdotes of Father Fisher. You all know who Father Fisher is, right? That's the priest with the big white beard, right? Good. His anecdotes of Father Fisher show how deeply the teaching of St. Agnes has sunk into him. I spent a happy Sunday here with the usual round of services. How important good sound teaching is. How important good sound teaching is. You know, I have come to find at times, in my short time as a priest, I've only been a priest about five years. I have come to find that sometimes the ecumenical movement within the church is more destructive than it is constructive. For the catechists in Mastic Point, the Baptist preachers are trying to convince the people how wrong what it is that we do is. The Plymouth Brethren, the Gospel Hall people from Canada, distribute their literature to convince the people that what we are doing is wrong. But the teaching of St. Agnes has sunk deeply into the life of this choir boy turned catechist. And he draws on that to keep the people in hand, to continue to make the place a spiritual oasis. You know what that means? A spiritual oasis in the desert. He was a choir boy right in this church, just like these little boys sitting in red and white here. And something Father Fisher was doing here was right, because it sunk into him, and he was able to carry it on. St. Agnes, how truly important good sound teaching is. I congratulate you on your new confirmation booklet. I've purchased one for myself. I've reviewed it, and it is a wonderful booklet. And I plan to buy 20 more for my confirmation class. And I hope that your rector gives me a discount. <laughs> because the teachings of our church are of paramount importance. Sunday school and confirmation class are of paramount importance. We must bend the tree while it is young. Nehemiah 8 verse 8 says, So they read from the book, from the law of God, with interpretation. They gave the sense so that people understood the reading. Leaving Mastic Point now, Matthews goes further north into Nichols Town. And this is what he writes. Your curate, Neil Nairn, is from Nichols Town. Nichols Town, too, is a lovely spot with its coconuts and beautiful beach. Father Fisher told the people to plant coconuts so they could have something to eat. He didn't just preach the gospel. He taught the people how to live, how to sustain himself. He was a priest at St. Agnes. Here the horrors, all the horrors of our unhappy division burst upon us. In the center stands the only decent and well-built church in the parish. That's the little church of St. Margaret. And if you've ever been there, you know how small St. Margaret is. But if, if St. Margaret was the best little church in the parish, well, God only knows what the rest look like. On one side stands a large Methodist chapel. On the other side stands a large Baptist chapel. And further on, a preaching house for the Plymouth Brethren. They are the gospel all people. And facing all of them stands a huge liquor shop which scents the street for long distance and does more work than the churches put together. So all of us, us and the Methodists and the Baptists and the Gospel, all of us working together to try to improve the lives of the people, the big shop is working 
can keep the people happy, eh? They're doing their job and they're doing it well. But we as a church, we must do our job and do it well. Listen to what he writes about the congregation in Nichols Town. On the whole, I was pleased with this little congregation. They have much to contend with. Three different sects persuading them that they are all wrong. They are a very strong little congregation holding on to what it is that they believe is right. Can you imagine three different churches telling you what you're doing is wrong? You have to be strong. And the little church in Nicholstown is strong. And you know, I hear a lot. Father, all y'all Anglicans do is y'all go drink wine. That's all y'all do. Don't y'all hear, say y'all don't hear that thing. Y'all hear it all the time, eh? Try to understand what it is what I'm doing. Understand why I use it. Why don't you come and say something, well, Father, I appreciate what it is that you're doing. I like this thing that you're doing. No. All y'all do is say something negative. You know? Well, St. Agnes, I want to teach you something today on this, your patronal festival. We all know that we use wine in the sacramental rite of the church, right? Where does it come from? It comes from the Passover, the Last Supper, right? That Jesus had the bread, and then he passed around the cup. It wasn't Coca-Cola in the cup, right? It was wine in the cup, right? I have to teach you, St. Agnes, because people are going to come and talk a bunch of foolishness to you. What does the reading uh, in the epistles say? Bear with me in a little foolishness. You have to know what it is why you do it so that you can explain to people what it is that you are doing. Jesus says, take this bread, break it, pass it around. Take this cup, drink from it, pass it around. And what does he say? Do this. In remembrance of me. We are following the imperative of the man who said, do this in remembrance of me. Now last week when I was preaching, um, something came to my mind. It was the wedding at Cana of Galilee where Jesus did what? He took water and he made it into wine. And the steward said, you have made the best wine. My God. You have made the best wine. But I want you to read carefully at the end of the gospel um, story in verse 11. Jesus did this. He made wine. The first of his signs in Cana of Galilee. And he revealed his glory. And out of this simple act of making wine, his disciples believed in him. Read the Bible carefully, my friend. Out of the simple act of making wine, he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. He didn't raise anyone from the dead or cure no sick or made the, the, the lame walk, you know. What did he do? He made wine. And his disciples went on to believe in him from this simple thing that he did. So the next time anyone talk any kind of foolishness to you, you tell them that wine is a tool that our Lord used to convict and convince his disciples. And you could tell them for the turn quest. The priest in North Andrus told you that. St. Agnes, for a very long time, you have been engaged in education, in the education process of many members of our society. Your infant school has long been established and is a fixture in this community. And a little further in the ghetto stands a school paid for personally. Listen to this good now, because you had a rich curate. Paid for personally by the curate of this church, the Reverend William Woodcock, and he's laying down right there. And according to Kirkley Sands in his book, his excellent book, The Anglican Church and Education in the Bahamas, Woodcock was a man of means, completely rebuilding the existing government school he found here in Grantstown and he paid for the housing costs and salaries for the two department heads. 
he did an interesting thing. He separated the boys and the girls so that they learned in their own groupings. Woodcock was on to something. Boys learn differently from girls. So what did he do? He separated them, the boys and the girls. In all of the cities in Europe, the cathedral schools, they may have a boys' grammar school. And they would have what? A girls' grammar school. And they're superb schools. But the children learn differently in their same grouping. Maybe we should try it here. Try it. Who knows? He purchased an unoccupied house for the girls of Woodcock School to have classes in, thereby freeing up their classroom space for an infant school for the babies. He initiated a program for the training of school teachers. All this Woodcock did, you know. He set up a school. He set up a school to train the teachers. And after his death as a young man, his successor as curate of St. Agnes, Robert Swan, and another young man, Edward Tate, who also went to the Woodcock School, they set about establishing an industrial training arm at the school to teach people agriculture as an alternative to shipwrecking. And we are still trying to teach our people the importance of agriculture. Any of you who have been to North Andrus know at the North Andrus High School, it was just on TV last night, we have a wonderful program of agriculture, spearheaded by Mr. Rai Budu. But the children say, Father, I ain't going on no farm. I already black enough as it is. I'm not going on no farm. <laughs> but I want you to notice something. The cornfields of Kansas are bigger than all of Andrus, you know. And the wheat fields of Canada are bigger than the entire Bahamas, you know. So if these people and their children could feed their nation and still send flour to me and you, why can't we do the same thing? If any of you have been to the Mennonite farm in North Andrus, the old and the young, even the little children jumping around on the tractor trying to do something, trying to, you know what I mean? But Woodcock was fighting a battle back then, and we too are fighting a battle today. Woodcock also recommended to the General Synod that the Woodcock School be used as a diocesan training center for the training of catechists. And we've been talking about this center that we need because we need to educate our people. So, St. Agnes, your place in history is secure. You have been strong in missionary enterprises and strong in primary education. Your church tradition is strong. Your social involvement is pronounced. So now, where do you go from here, St. Agnes? Where do you go from here? The answer, I believe, again lies in teaching. Matthew 18 and 6 says, If any of you put a stumbling block before any of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were fastened around your neck and you were drowned in the depths of the sea. And many of the people sitting in our pews of our churches today are children of the faith. Their understanding of theology is juvenile at best. They are afraid to delve further into what the scriptures are saying at a level past their infant Sunday school or confirmation. They are afraid to go further. Nobody is interested in Bible study. Right? Nobody's interested in Bible study because as far as, as we are all concerned, you could read the Bible and I could read the Bible. We could all interpret it and apply it to our lives, right? That's what everybody says who picks up a Bible, right? Talk to me. However, you and I can read the same thing in the Bible and it can mean two different things. Something different for you and something different for me. 
And if 20 people read the same thing in the Bible, we can come up with 20 different interpretations, right? Can't we do that? And so that's why Nehemiah says what Ezra those said in Nehemiah 8 and verse 8. The priests and the scribes read from the book of the law of God with interpretation. They gave the sense so that people could understand the reading. The word of warning comes out to all of us who dare to preach the gospel to the people. Be careful of what you say. I have to be careful of what comes out of this mouth right here. And we all must be careful of what we say. Because if our words cause a little one to fall, the punishment upon the preacher is severe. Be careful how you interpret the scripture. For a millstone is a heavy burden to bear. Eh? Be careful. When God reveals upon you that he wants you to get involved or he, he wants to raise you up to do something, it may not be to get up in here to preach, you know. Everybody getting up to preach. God may want you to drive the bus. He may want you to cook the food. He might want you to put out these candles, to decorate this church, to print the bulletin, to staple it. But everybody wants to get up to preach. Be careful. The judgment upon me is severe. In Nickel Town, a lot of things haven't changed much. People are still trying to convince the little congregation that what they are doing is wrong. And in order to combat this, we have implemented something new. We are doing something new in Nichols Town. We run a Bible study course in Lent and Advent. Four weeks in Lent and four weeks in Advent. That's when we run our Bible study classes. Because as soon as school closed, in the summer, everybody gone, right? Good. In Lent and Advent, we run our Bible study. And the course that we are studying, we are studying a degree course from the University of London in Nichols Town. St. Agnes, what are you studying? We are studying a degree course from the University of London where we are exploring the deeper theology of our faith. We are studying Christology. We are studying Soteriology. You know what that means? Oh. <laughs> we are studying patristics. We are studying early church history. Soteriology is the whole doctrine of salvation, eh? We are putting flesh on the bones of the people. And only the faithful few come to Bible study. And it is only they who are embracing Jesus as a child who are growing in the faith. We study salvation because it is important. Isn't salvation important, St. Agnes? Yes. It's, it's supremely important. We want to be saved. And we are saved because Jesus has saved us. For our sins, he was lifted high on the what? He was lifted high upon the cross for our sins. But that doesn't mean just because he has saved that we don't have a part to play. And one of the most controversial things, issues in this church, in, in not only this church, but in every church, is this whole business, well, Father, are you saved? You know, people always ask you, are you saved? Being saved is not a process that happens overnight. It is a process when Jesus comes into your life. And you start to grow the fruits of the spirit that people should be able to see in you. You don't need to say nothing because they're supposed to be able to see it. Even Nicodemus, the great teacher of the Jews, 
came to Jesus by night to say what? What must I do? And he says, Jesus says to him, you must be born again. So when you're born again and you're a baby in the crib, you don't get up and walk and go to work, right? It takes time for you to grow. And so you must take your time, be educated, and grow in the faith. St. Agnes, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to teach the people. Teach them the true religion of the church. Teach the adults who act like children Teach them who Jesus is. Teach them to believe in him in order to have eternal life. Teach them how to have manners and respect for authority. Teach them how not to be rebellious. Teach them, St. Agnes, that's your job. Let me tell you a little story about a church in Cambridge because the problem isn't just here, it's all over the world. There's an old church just outside the city center in Cambridge in a place called Trumpington. And while I used to live inside the city, there were problems going on outside the city. In an established church just like yours, the priest in the church wanted to put a toilet in the church. The little old ladies who came to church, don't forget it's cold now and it's snowing on the ground, and the only people who come to church over there are what? The little old ladies, eh? Thank God for them. The priest wanted to put over on the side where no one could see a little bathroom. So that when the people came to church, they wouldn't have to go outside and wait for the bus to get home. You know what I mean? And they took they took that fellow to the Archbishop of Canterbury for putting a toilet in the church. St. Agnes, don't fall into that trap, here. Yeah? Do not fall into that trap. The Divinity Faculty and the Faculty of Psychology at the University of Cambridge through Dr. Sarah Savage, who taught me, and Fraser Watts, who is the priest at St. Leonard's, St. Edward's. They came up with a program called the Beta Course because the psychology of people who would try to prevent a toilet from being put in an old church so that old people could use the bathroom was something that they had to study. <laughs> and if Cambridge going to study it, it's something that is important. And they came up with this wonderful program that I hope that one day we can probably use in this diocese. It's called the Beta Course. It's a fabulous program. Where we as a church need to concentrate on saving souls. We as we have the church have to concentrate on bringing people in. That's why we have the Alpha Course. We have, as a church, to concentrate on renewing people in discovery and casio. That's what they are for. And then if you are brave enough, there's EFM. And maybe one day, St. Agnes, my challenge to you. Maybe you, St. Agnes, will come up with a course for people to study, to help them to go a little bit deeper in their faith. You are a powerful church, a landmark church, with the brightest and best in here, right in here. St. Agnes, your challenge is to be bold. Come up with something new like your confirmation book. Behold, I make all things new. St. Agnes, 
For in Luke chapter 12 and verse 48, it reads, But the one who did not know and did what deserve a beating will receive a light beating. From everyone to whom much has been given, much will be required. And from one to whom much has been entrusted, even more will be demanded. So, St. Agnes, on this special, special day, in this, the life of your church, your patronal festival, and I hope to come back this afternoon to march the parade with you and enjoy the fellowship afterwards with you. I salute you, St. Agnes, in this place. As you seek to continue valiantly to fight against sin, the world, and the devil, do not let your legacy be one of mere trappings, but rather like the old missionary priest, Father Fisher, with the old big white beard. Blaze new trails. Do new things. Educate the people, St. Agnes, so that they will not search after empty cliches. And people are searching, young and old, dumb and smart, they are searching for something. Be innovative and creative, St. Agnes, and take heed of the warning of 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17. For the time has come for judgment to begin with the household of God. If it begins with us, what will be the end for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinners? Therefore, let those suffering in accordance with God's will entrust themselves to a faithful creator while continuing to do good. St. Agnes, I implore you on this day to continue to do good. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
following the singing of the creed, we now have the intercessions led by Mrs. Annette Cartwright. Intercessions form B, page 107. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. Give to the departed eternal rest. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. Let us pray for our needs and those of others. Almighty God, to whom our needs are known before we ask, help us to ask only what accords to your will and the good things which we dare not, or in our blindness cannot ask. Grant us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us therefore confess our sins. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and one another in thought, word, and deed. And in what we have left undone. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness. Keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ. Our Lord. Amen. We are the body of Christ by the one spirit. We were all baptized into one body. The peace of the Lord be always with you.
Morning, church. Morning, church. Morning, church. Sit down, church. Today is a Sunday within the octave of the Feast of St. Agnes, our patron saint. The remaining services for the day at 10.30 will be song mass and sermon. Our great service of Thanksgiving begins this afternoon at 3 o'clock with solemn even song, sermon, and outdoor procession of witness and benediction. The preacher will be the very Reverend Patrick Adley, the Dean of Nassau. And we would like to assure Father Turnquest we are going the long way. Um, so please let's be on time and let's make it what it ought to be. Um, following the service, there will be our reception. And um, please follow the instructions. The parish hall is reserved for the senior members of the church. I repeat, it's reserved for the senior members of the church. Okay? Um, so I ask you to be Christian. In our prayers, we remember the Grant family at this time as they mourn the loss of Mr. Vernon Grant. He will be buried next Sunday at the regular 2.30 here from the church. Let us continue to pray for his wife and his children, those who have been so faithful um, these um, many years. I will meet with the usher board on Thursday at 6 o'clock and with the senior choir, all members of the senior choir, A-L-L, -L, at 7 o'clock on Thursday. Um, please read the bulletins for the remainder of your uh, information. We are on television, and we need to use that time as wisely as we can. Thank you very much. I forgot to mention our... our Priest Warden is back in church. I know he wouldn't miss an Agnes Day for nothing in the world. Mr. Woods, where are you? Stand, let everybody see how young you are looking. And I forgot to mention that nominations are open for four seats on the vestry to serve the year 2010-2012. Uh, the retiring persons are Mr. Kevin Hanna, Mrs. Octavia Johnson, Dr. Pandora Johnson and Mr. Paul King. All of these persons are eligible for re-election. Nominations are open until Thursday at midday, and they must be submitted to me, M-E, <laughs> uh, signed by registered members of the church and seconded. Thank you very much. We now have a selection by the senior choir. Now let us all praise God and sing.
we now have the offertory hymn, Blessed Feasts of Blessed Martyrs, after which we go straight into the canon of Mass, which will include the consecration and the dispensing of communion to the faithful. Thing, always and everywhere to give you thanks 
Father Almighty, everlasting God. For in the saints you have given us an example of godly living, that rejoicing in their fellowship, we may run with perseverance a race that is set before us, and with them receive the crown of glory. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn, to proclaim the glory of your name. Let's see you come to name. gives you praise. All life, all holiness comes from you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, whom you sent to shed our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. We therefore bring you these gifts. We ask you to make them holy by the power of your Holy Spirit. They may become the body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who offered himself in obedience to your will, the perfect sacrifice for all mankind. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. When he had given thanks, he gave to them and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it for the remembrance of me. Proclaim the mystery of our faith. Father, calling to mind the death your Son endured for our salvation, his glorious resurrection and ascension, his continual intercession for us in heaven and looking for his coming again in glory, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and life-giving sacrifice. Look with favor on your church's offering. 
Grant that we who eat and drink these holy gifts may be filled with your Holy Spirit, become one body in Christ, serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. May he make us a perpetual offering to you and enable us in communion with Blessed Mary, the whole company of heaven, to share the inheritance of your saints. With him, and in him, and through him, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we worship you, Father Almighty, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, in songs of everlasting praise. Savior has taught us, so we pray. <laughs> 